Let's talk about acceptance and how we recognise acceptance in the wild. Okay, so to reach an agreement, we need to have an offer. That offer needs to be matched by an acceptance while the offer is still open and the acceptance has to be validly communicated. Do all of those things, we have an agreement for the purposes of common law. So, what itself is an acceptance? Sorry about the colour contrast on that slide, that is not very um, accessibility correct. An acceptance is an unqualified assent, an unqualified agreement to the terms of an offer that is still open. So that's the offer that's still open, not the acceptance that's still open. Offers have a period of time. Acceptance, once it happens, it's happened and we've got an agreement. In a bilateral contract, acceptance is the making of a promise to the offeror. And we'll talk about this more next week when we get to consideration. But even if it's only for a couple of seconds, in a bilateral contract, at the point that the agreement is made, both parties, bilateral or multilateral, all parties will have obligations. So even if I'm doing something as simple as buying a cup of coffee, at the time the agreement is made, I promise to pay money in exchange for a promise of a cup of coffee. The contract is completely fulfilled, completely executed, um, at the point in time when the money is handed over and the coffee is handed over. So both parties have a promise at that time. In a unilateral contract, as you now well know, it's the doing of the thing that the offeror has requested is the acceptance. So it's at the point in time that that thing is done that the contract is made, so only the offeror has any obligations when the contract exists. In fact, technically only ever has obligations because you are never obliged to accept the unilateral contract. Acceptance itself is determined using an objective approach and Taylor and Johnson is the key case from an Australian point of view in relation to that point. So a whole heap of different issues arise. We're going to run out of time to talk about all of them. And so what I want to do is be your guide to you understanding what the key issues are. It will not surprise you that in the next couple of days you are going to get a problem task. Next week, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about how to write a memorandum of advice, how to write to another lawyer. Um, it is highly likely, because I profess not to be a psychopath, that this problem will largely deal with the stuff that is in this topic, in this first topic. Okay, so that you'll be going at the point that you get the, the problem. Now, I'm not going to promise it'll be exclusively about offer and acceptance, but there's a lot in there. Um, and as you already know, particularly our discussion of offer, we've had to start to understand some of the other elements of contract formation. So it will not be a waste of your time to make sure that you have at least glanced at consideration, certainty and intention so that you've got a sense of what all of the formation elements are when you're approaching the pro uh, question. And I need to have that on the recording so that you don't put in a complaint that I promised you that the first assignment would only deal with offer and acceptance or agreement generally, because I am definitely not making you that promise, but again, not a psychopath. And I would like you to both be able to confidently do the exercise, but also learn about some of the stuff that we may or may not have actually spoken about in the class. So, some of the kinds of issues that arise we started to talk about in that quiz that we were just doing. So, who can accept an offer? Offers are generally made to a person and the person can accept the offer. But depends on how the offer is made as to who can accept. A unilateral offer that's made to the world could be accepted by anybody. A unilateral or a, 
a, a bilateral uh, a standard offer might be made to a particular class of people. I will sell that telephone to any of the people in this room. First in, first served, accepting my offer. Um, so that's effectively an offer made to each of you or to a class of people. Um, you're going to need to understand how we determine whether acceptance has happened. So we're just talking just before the break about silence. So silence itself is not a mechanism for acceptance, but you can get very close to silence. So there just needs to be something that indicates or communicates assent, agreement to the offer. Um, another issue that often comes up is when there are multiple conversations or documents between the parties identifying where the offer is, what the acceptance is and what group of documents creates the terms, like how do you know. Um, and then there are a group of issues that keep arising around the different ways that people can accept. So when and where is a contract made are often the kind of cases that we look at. Particularly, we've got to ask ourselves when and where if acceptance is communicated by a letter, if, if acceptance is communicated by some sort of electronic transaction, uh, online or by email or by a thumbs up emoji on your telephone or grinder or wherever it is that you make contracts. Um, so, we use an objective test. So there's some basic rules, but we use an objective test. So it doesn't matter what the parties actually intended. What matters is what a reasonable person in the position of the parties would have understood. So Taylor and Johnson is really the seminal case in this. So again, it, this is um, Acting Chief Justice Mason and Justices <coughs> Murphy and Dean say, the, as far as the law is concerned, sorry, the law is concerned, not with the real intentions of the parties, but with the outward manifestations of those intentions. So you might have had absolutely no intention of ever going through with that contract, but if you signed it and you shook hands and you said yes, it doesn't matter. The outward manifestations, the behaviour demonstrates intention and as a consequence acceptance and the creation of a contract. So, range of different rules. I'm going to high level them and we'll work out which ones we need to concentrate on in the time that we have. An offeror may waive the right to be notified. So the general rule is we must have offer, capable acceptance on its terms, all of the DNA of the deal, that is then accepted, <coughs> assent, and that acceptance is communicated. But the offeree, offeror might say, actually, you don't need to communicate. All you have to do is do the thing. Um, in fact, when I buy a cup of coffee, particularly because I'm rather grumpy before I drink coffee, particularly early in the morning, I can have a tendency to just look at the guy, the barista, who knows what I get most days and not say anything and just slide my money across the table. Um, there might be no communication. The method of acceptance must be in accordance with the method stipulated if it's stipulated to be the only method. So I am prepared to sell you this telephone I will accept, um, I, I, I want a million dollars for it and the way that you accept is through interpretive dance. The only way you can accept is through interpretive dance, sending me an email, sending me an SMS, saying yes I want to spend a million dollars on a telephone that doesn't <laughs> even belong to you. None of those will be acceptable. I need you to actually get up and dance. Um, ridiculous example. Uh, if no method is stipulated, then the method will be something that's equally prompt. So if I make you an offer by email and you reply by carrier pigeon, I can probably say that actually that 
is not a valid means of acceptance. I very rarely check my carrier pigeons. Um, if I make you an offer by email or online and you respond to me by post, I might also reject that this day, these days. It's a slower, different method. I hardly ever look at the post. I assume everything's a bill. I don't open my letters. Uh, if I send you an offer by one particular email address and you respond to a different email address, I might be able to reject that as well. I might have some argument, well, that's not communicating to me. Again, it'll depend on what the facts are. Acceptance occurs when and where the offeror receives or is deemed to receive acceptance. So, if I am um, here in this classroom and I am in the process of selling <coughs> guitar pedals, my husband's always selling guitar pedals or buying them. Say I am selling some guitar pedals and right now on Gumtree somebody has accepted my offer of this guitar pedal and they happen to be in Queensland. <coughs> it's happened right now. They're in Queensland, I am here. Where does acceptance happen? When it's communicated to me, maybe. Um, we'll pull it. I'm asking where first. Um, I'll go to Clay, actually. Uh, yes, it's an instant form of communication. So, well, and in fact, instant forms of communication actually just reflect the general law. So it's at my end. But so it would happen policy. where I retrieve or the email, but because it's an email or it's an instantaneous communication, it happens where I retrieve it, so Victoria, and it happens when I am capable of retrieving it from the server. So I don't actually have to have seen it. I'm here teaching away, but somebody on Gumtree has hit that want to buy button or whatever it is. And at that point in time when they do that and it's capable of, I can see it, whether I do see it or not, that's the time. So that's the Electronic Communications Act that adds that last bit in. But um, as Clay rightfully noted, it is, it's an electronic communication. Um, what's interesting is electronic communications um, deal with the general law. What makes things difficult is that Postal, exception, uh, postal acceptance is an exception from the general rule. So we will talk about that. Um, and it's less and less relevant because very few people do business by post anymore. Um, acceptance can be inferred from conduct. Silence alone is, will not do it, but it can be inferred from conduct. So you make me an offer, I shake your hand, you can infer from that that I accepted his offer. Okay, I punch him in the nose, probably a little bit more difficult to infer that I accepted. On an objective test, conduct, including silence, may indicate acceptance. It's conduct, though, that includes silence, silence by itself. So in Empanol and Maction Paul, um, effectively what happened was that the, uh, there was a firm of architects, they were doing some work for a developer, they sent their terms and conditions off, the developer said, or the, the actual company said, oh, Mr. so-and-so, uh, Mr. Much and Paul, probably, um, he doesn't sign contracts, he doesn't believe in contracts, he either trusts you or he doesn't, he's not going to sign it. And the architect said, well, maybe, but these are our terms and conditions and this is the basis on which we're prepared to do the work. So they sent them again and they sent an invoice which was then paid and then a little bit down the track, uh, the developer, not necessarily a surprise when they don't like contracts, went into liquidation. So the question became, was there a contract? Because had the developer actually accepted the terms and conditions that the architects had put forward? And the court found, well, yes, they had. That their conduct in... Sure, they hadn't signed it, 
but their conduct in paying the, in, uh, the invoice, in continuing to order additional work after the terms and conditions had been provided, when the developer, uh, when the architecture had said, well, actually, this is the basis on which we do the work, was enough. Even though no offer and acceptance is identified, parties' contact can infer mutual agreement. So this is the Brambles test that I was mentioning earlier. So in commercial negotiations, it's very rare that we have this or that. In fact, most of you, if any of you work in commercial firms, will see that what happens is somebody decides to do a deal. There's usually some sort of vague heads of agreement of some term type, which will often say it's not binding. But it will stipulate the key things like the price and the time that something's going to be done and things like that. And then it's off to the lawyers to create an agreement. First draft gets drafted. And so let's say I'm acting for the purchaser. I draft a contract. Surprise, surprise, all of the terms are very pro-purchaser. So I send it off to you, lawyers for the other side, you get your markup on, you change a whole lot of things around, you change those guarantees that I was requesting from your client and indemnities to make them mutual or you might even remove them and then you send it back to me. So you could think of it as my first draft is an offer but then the second draft comes back as a counter offer. But then we get around the table together and we negotiate it page by page and we keep changing things. So who's made the offer, who hasn't made the offer? Like who, how does that work? When, when I was a young wee little slip of a girl at the beginning of my career as a lawyer, one of the things we often did is if you had a very big and complex deal, you would get all of the paper, everything would be printed. Um, the day before documents would be signed, the parties would go into a room, so the lawyers would go, and we would check page by page that they matched what our expectations of the draft were. You would then put everything into a box and we would seal the box so that you could tell if it had been broken or not. Then the next day, everybody would come into the room to sign the documents and you'd have, you know, you might have seen them. They still quite like doing them in Asia, these kind of signing ceremonies where everybody lines up. But often you would have two copies of the document, identical copies, and both CEOs or sets of directors would start signing at the same time and be like, you know, ready, set, go. Because if one party gave the other one a signed document saying, yeah, I'm ready to go, then they would be the offeror. <laughs> and then the other one would be accepting, technically. So everybody would sign at the same time. So by that stage, you kind of run out of benefits in having a difference in time. But it is, it is interesting. Well, I think it's interesting. So, Taylor and Johnson again, would a reasonable person, having regard to their external manifestations of conduct, consider the parties to have reached agreement? That ultimately is the nub of what we're looking at when it comes to acceptance. Was that conduct sufficient to basically germinate that egg of deal DNA? So, Taylor and Johnson, I will I'll sit there with the facts. I'm not going to go through them in too much detail, um, but so that you know that they're there as a little summary if they're hard to find. The thing that makes this subject, uh, this case a little bit difficult for some first-time readers of it is it deals with two sets of issues. We're most interested here in this idea of whether or not there was acceptance of the offer. But the second issue goes to mistake, which is not what we're covering here. And you will probably, I would assume you'll come back to this case when you look at it in advanced contract law or when you look at the question of the vitiating factor of a mistake. So the reason that mistake is issued, basically that two parties, they were negotiating in relation to the price of the land. There was a misunderstanding. So uh, Mrs uh, Johnson, uh, believed that um, that the price that she was getting would be 1500 bucks an acre um, but actually the documentation showed that it was going to be 15,000 bucks all up 
and she misunderstood and there was some evidence that uh, Mr Taylor knew about the misunderstanding. Um, but there were two sets of issues here. Did she accept the offer or not? And then was that contract vitiated? If there was a contract, if she had accepted and if there was in fact a contract, was the exercise of that contract vitiated by the mistake? And ultimately, they won on the mistake point, but they didn't win. So the, the case is actually helpful for us in the sense of looking at what the rules for acceptance are and how there was objectively an acceptance in this particular case, even though that would patently have been a very unfair result. Not the subjective beliefs or understandings of the parties about their rights and liabilities that govern their contractual relations. What matters is what the party by words and conduct would have led a reasonable person in the position of the other party to believe. Um, and yeah, so I've made that point all right, uh, already, that the, ultimately the decision was based on the different point. This is a case be wary quoting this case uh, or citing this case because it's it's an AAT decision. Actually, I think it was heard in the uh, by a single judge in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. But it's not of particular high weight, but I think it's a really nice uh, uh, illustration of the point. Uh, Mrs. Chong did what many of us might do with a sore head in early January. Decided that she would join a gym. So she went into the gym, she got shown around, she was given a form to sign. I don't believe she ever went to the gym. And a few months or a few weeks later, she went back and she said, actually, I'd like to cancel my contract, my month to month contract with the gym. And they said, sure, we'll do that for you. Um, we'll just withdraw this additional $200 uh, cancellation fee. Hang on a minute, I didn't. I didn't agree to that. And they said, yes, you did. You signed this contract. She said, but I didn't even know that was in there. How could I have reached agreement with you about something that I didn't read, that I didn't see? <coughs> I really quote this case, or tell you about this case, because it's something I can imagine myself doing um, very easily. I think it's very easy for us to empathise with her. So ultimately, the tribunal held uh, or at first instance it was held that um, Mrs Chong didn't have the required consensus at Edom, that she hadn't agreed to that term. Very quickly overturned. Um, tribunals are not always great on the law. Um, and this is an old point. The English case is called Lestrange and Graukolb. We'll look at it in a few, um, few weeks' time. There is a general rule from the Strange and Graukob where a person who signs a document which looks like a contract, smells like a contract, you understand to be a contract, will be bound by that contract even if you don't read it. So it doesn't matter that there is no consensus. If it looked like a contract, then you have every reason to believe that you are taking on some obligations as well as getting some rights, the right to not go to the gym every week. So, um, so why is that? We keep, we've spent all this time up until now, we're now three and, or two and three quarters of a week into this course, and I keep talking about consensus and the meeting of the mind and the acceptance matching the offer. Here, let's assume it's structured in a pretty much normal way, um, they, the gym, provides her with a set of terms on which they would be prepared to treat with her, their invitation to treat. She signs the form as an offer to become a member. They then accept her membership application. It's likely how it is. But she never read it. She's made an offer. So how on earth can she have met that consensus? And the court's saying, well, it doesn't matter if she signed it. You touch it, you buy it. Um, so why would, why would the court, why would the law work that way? Isn't that unfair? Otherwise, if you read the contract, you could say I didn't read the terms of the contract. 
Exactly. Every contract, in fact, there would be a benefit to not reading contracts. So the act of signing something is universally understood to be a serious thing. Now, what's really interesting in that is most of the contract, many of the contracts we make now, we make by clicking a button. I accept. There should be, usually is, a link to the terms somewhere. But usually they take so long to load, I don't even bother. But I often actually grab the terms so I can have a look at them <coughs> later. But I'm too impatient. I've hit I accept before I've read them. Um, I know I won't be alone in that, but I know there are some of you who would never do that either. Uh, so yeah, fitness first. They went straight to go. They collected their $200. Okay, unilateral contracts have already spoken about this. We know that offer, uh, uh, that, sorry, what am I going to say here? Um, we know that knowledge of the offer is required. But the other part of that question is knowledge of acceptance. Is that required? Um, so, sorry, we've spoken about this. Crown and Clark, there's a couple of slides there dealing with that. I just spoke about that earlier. Um, I'm going to just assume what I said made sense. Um, an act constituting acceptance needs to be made in reliance of the offer. So knowledge, like anything else with acceptance, acceptance needs to be communicated. Carl Hill and Carbolic Smokeball is authority of the proposition though that not everybody needs to accept and it, there can be a delay. So if you are offering, as in that case, it was pretty much like a reward case, we want you to do these things and if something goes wrong, we will pay you. We only, it's only necessary to let us know that you did those things if something goes wrong. The logistics of dealing with everybody who tells us that something, uh, that they've taken the medicine would be difficult. Now, where does that play out in modern life? Um, if you buy something and it comes with a warranty card, and it says, used to, well, they used to say things like, oh, we, you need to provide, attach a proof of purchase, send this back in or we won't guarantee this product. Now, there is legislation now that says you can't do that, that there are statutory warranties, statutory guarantees that have to be given with the pro products anyway, regardless of what it is that people say about the guarantees or the, the support that they will give. But again, usually most companies find it's logistically very difficult to process every single purchaser at the beginning, unless they've got some other reason for wanting that information. It's actually give me the proof of purchase if and when it breaks. Is the way those things, that's an example of how that works in real life. Okay, in a roundabout way, this is why I don't like slides. They're so linear and we don't really work in a linear way. Um, so general rule here in relation to acceptance is it needs to be, well clearly, it needs to be accepted before, uh, and often needs to be accepted before a binding contract can be made but the acceptance also needs to be communicated. And the acceptance becomes effective when it's communicated. So agreements are made in the place and at the time that acceptance is communicated. I want to talk briefly about this case. So LaTeX, Finance and Knight. Um, I'll go through the facts on this one because people often find them a little bit difficult to get their heads around. So Mr Knight signed a hire purchase agreement with a company called Latex to purchase the television. So how it would have worked is he's gone into a shop somewhere. So imagine Harvey Norman or the good guys or something like that. He's picked out a TV that he likes. They've said something, you might have known in advance, but let's say they've said to him, oh, you don't need to pay for that now. You can enter into a high purchase agreement with us. And they then say, and, and, and so then he basically goes and gets a form which says, it, it's, it's set up as a kind of application. Well, it says it's an application, an application for finance. So Mr. 
Knight applies for the finance, signs the form, and then good guys, Harmony Norman, David Jones, whoever it is, takes that form and puts it through for processing and presumably either let him take the TV at that point or they deliver it later. Uh, LaTeX actually took the form, goes and, and the words on the form basically said that uh, it was only an agreement to lend the money was only effective when LaTeX had accepted the application. So they then processed the document. They got a big fat stamp and stamped accepted on it at some point, but they never communicated back to Mr Knight. Mr Knight decided he didn't want the TV any, uh, afterwards and he returned it. Some time after that, LaTeX said, you haven't made any high purchase payments, we're going to sue you for the money and the interest. And he's like, you know, I don't even have the TV anymore. This is, this is not right. But the question went to the court. Ultimately, the question for decision was whether LaTeX, the finance company, had accepted the offer to borrow money. New South Wales Court of Appeal, a contract is not made until acceptance of the offer has been communicated. It was not enough just to sign the form, to stamp accepted on it. They had to actually tell Mr Knight that his application had followed through. Now, chances are what happened is that they... Sorry, I'm annoying you. I'm wandering around in circles. Um, what they did is they said... So LaTeX said to the good guys or Harvey Norman <laughs> or whatever, yep, yeah, that finance is approved, go and deliver the TV. And my guess is that the way that they organised themselves is they would have paid a commission to the shop for the number of loans that they were entered into and probably once a month or so they would do a reconciliation. So at the end of the month they would say, OK, you sold 100 TVs, here's... Um, we will give you the money for the TVs uh, plus a commission in relation to that amount of money and then we'll go off from there. So, so there would have been a disconnect. Clearly there was a process disconnect between him returning the TV because you know, he just thinks he's dealing with the shop. So again, reason for having this case, partly to get you thinking about the acceptance, uh, acceptance or a contract being made in terms of an application by the borrower. And think about that. Uh, why would they have structured their contract that way? Why is he making an offer to borrow money as opposed to them making an offer to lend him money? He might have no credit. He might have no credit, exactly. By being the party who is accepting, they're the ones with the power. So they set up the terms, they make an application, and this is similar to Gibson, the way we, when we talked about it with Gibson as well, uh, and Manchester City Council. It's by actually getting the customer to make an application with all of the information on it, then they have the power to accept or reject it. And think about, if we take that a little further, if they didn't have to communicate their acceptance, they could sit there with a whole pile of not accepted um, applications for a really long period of time and then basically say, well, you know, there's no contract. You, you need to give us this money or where, you know, whatever the, the end result is. So, they, yeah. Easy peasy. So, one of the other things that we learned from that case is that clear language is required if an exception to the rule is agreed. So, if you're going to say, so if, if LaTeX was going to set up their rules of engagement to say, if you don't hear anything within seven days, you can assume we've accepted, they could have done that. If you get delivery of your television, that is acceptance, demonstrates our acceptance, but they didn't do that. So the language needs to be very, very clear. Exceptions to the general rule. In situations involving unilateral offers where an offeror did not expect or require notification of acceptance. This is not a unilateral offer though. And where an offer expressly or impliedly provides for acceptance to be communicated in a particular way, then it needs to be communicated in that way. It doesn't actually matter whether it's received or not. 
So it could have been an email process or it could have been accepted by the signature, some physical act, but that's fine. Um, we've talked about that and we've talked about that. Okay, we're going to run out of time. I hate these first two weeks. They always, I just want to have a quick look at something to just give you the very last bit. Is that going to do it? No, that is not what I want. Uh, I'm just sorry, I'm just going to flick this way. Um, Postal acceptance rule and communicate. I'll be really quick about this and there is a desk lecture about this. The trick to the postal acceptance rule is remembering that the postal acceptance rule is an exception to the general rule. The general rule is that acceptance happens where and when it is communicated. So if we're in a room together and we negotiate an agreement, you make an offer, I accept it, the contract is made where and when we reach that point. If we use an electronic or an instantaneous form of communication, then it happens where and when the uh, acceptance is communicated to the offeror. So the gum tree example I used before, doing it over email, it happens where and when it is capable of being retrieved from a server by the individual. Now what happened in the very olden days is people who were doing commercial deals did them by post. And post was unreliable. Probably not as unreliable as it is now, but it was unreliable nonetheless. So effectively the question became when was an, and where is an acceptance communicated? So the exception for the general rule if you send something by post is it's accepted where and when it gets put in the letterbox where it's no longer in the control of the offeree and it's winging its way. So the case there was Adams and Linzel <coughs> Uh, and the slides will outline each of the points in relation to that. But remember, it is an exception of less and less relevance. It was much more relevant in the early 80s when I learnt about it than it will be for you because really the only reason you would rapidly get something in the post is to take advantage of that rule right now. Um, and I think it would be pretty tricky if you did so. So we've got... It's five minutes to go until 8.30, so I'm going to uh, wind up there. We're going to start our shoot on Sunday night with a problem. Next week, uh, we will possibly finish off a couple of these things because I really want to talk about consensus in a broader sense. Don't worry about that. We always catch up. Uh, and l I also want to spend a bit of time talking about how to write a memorandum of advice because that will be part of the task for your assessment task, which I will release in the next 48 hours or so. Hope